Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Respiratory physiology is being discussed under these headings. We decided to go in the reverse order. Having completed cellular respiration in the previous session, we will now look at transport of gases in blood, in particular oxygen. Oxygen travels in two forms in blood, two major forms. One that is dissolved in plasma as well as erythrocyte intracellular fluid. And the other major form is oxygen that is loosely bound to hemoglobin. Dissolved oxygen exists within plasma as well as erythrocytes. We will refer to this collectively as dissolved oxygen. And then there is oxygen that is bound to hemoglobin. Dissolved oxygen can be thought of as forming the interface between alveolar oxygen and oxygen bound to hemoglobin. This is what equilibrates with alveolar oxygen and in turn determines how much of oxygen is bound to hemoglobin. The relationship between dissolved oxygen an oxygen bound to hemoglobin is what we study as the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. One might also think of it as the oxygen hemoglobin association curve, but the general use of the term is oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve, which describes how much of oxygen dissociates from hemoglobin as the partial pressure of dissolved oxygen reduces. What is on the y axis here? is percent saturation of hemoglobin. We will learn this term shortly. Dissolved oxygen is estimated as a partial pressure of oxygen. What do we mean by that? The intuitive understanding of dissolved oxygen would be how much of oxygen is dissolved in say 100 ml of blood. That is milliliters of oxygen dissolved in 100 ml blood is comprehensible. What do we understand by partial pressure of dissolved oxygen? Partial pressure of oxygen is an estimate of dissolved oxygen, which is easier to do. To get the partial pressure of oxygen dissolved in arterial blood, we need an arterial blood sample. And if we want to estimate in venous blood, we need a venous blood sample. A blood sample that is taken is expelled into a test tube and it should fill the whole of the test tube with a little bit of air space on top when you stopper the test tube. Atmospheric oxygen is usually at a partial pressure of 160 millimeters mercury in the planes. Now, if you allow oxygen in the space to equilibrate with the oxygen in blood and estimate the partial pressure of the gas here after some time, it is going to be reflective of what is there in blood rather than what is there in air because there is more of blood as compared to the air space here. So, if you estimate it after equilibration say in arterial blood, you will get a partial pressure of about 100 millimeters mercury if everything else is normal and this reflects the dissolved oxygen concentration. You can multiply this with a constant 0.003 to get how much of oxygen is dissolved in 100 ml blood. In this case, for example, 100 into this constant will give us 0.3 ml of oxygen dissolved in 100 ml of arterial blood. If instead of taking so much blood in the test tube, leaving only a small amount of air space, if we took less blood and there was a lot of air space, then after equilibration, the partial pressure that you measure will be more reflective of air than blood or you will overestimate partial pressure of oxygen in blood that way. The same argument would hold good if there was an air bubble in the blood sample. That air, the oxygen contained in that air will also contaminate your reading. To reiterate what we mean by partial pressure of gases in blood, we have to be clear that gases exert a pressure or a partial pressure only in gaseous mixtures, they do not exert a pressure in liquids. The actual concentration of dissolved gas should be expressed as milliliters of the gas 
per unit volume of the liquid in which it is dissolved. However, we express dissolved oxygen in blood as a partial pressure because of the way it is measured. The gas is allowed to equilibrate with a small gaseous space and an estimate of the partial pressure of the gas in this space is reflective of the concentration of the dissolved gas. Let this represent an arterial blood sample and this represent a venous blood sample. In the normal situation, partial pressure of dissolved oxygen would be 100 millimeter mercury in arterial blood. It is represented as PaO2, small a standing for arterial. If that is a capital A, it would be alveolar, the small a stands for arterial. The actual dissolved oxygen concentration would be partial pressure into this constant, which will give us this number. In venous blood, in the resting conditions, PO2 would be 40 millimeters mercury, we refer to this as PVO2 and that would be the actual dissolved oxygen concentration. We have just seen that dissolved oxygen concentration is estimated as a partial pressure. We will now see how to estimate the amount of oxygen bound to hemoglobin. Prior to that, we will look at properties of hemoglobin in brief. Hemoglobin is a tetramer of four globin heme moieties. If this is a globin moiety, this can represent the heme moiety that is attached to it. Four such globin heme moieties make up hemoglobin. These two globin chains may be thought of as the alpha globin chains and these two as the beta globin chains. Molecular oxygen would bind to the ion which is there in the heme moiety. Now, two adjacent globin moieties can be thought of as being kept close to each other with something like a latch there. When they are opposed like this, we can also imagine a loaded spring which is there in between these two globin molecules and if the latch opens, then that spring would just spring out pushing apart the two globin moieties, what would be called as the relaxed form of hemoglobin. When the latch is on, we can think of hemoglobin as existing in the tense form or the T form. This form has a very low affinity for oxygen. In fact, it is deoxyhemoglobin. When there is abundance of oxygen outside, oxygen can negotiate its way into one of the globin heme complexes and when it binds to one heme moiety there, the latch is thought to open up, pushing the spring apart and allowing these two globin moieties to go into what is called the relaxed state. Now you notice that the cleft is larger and it is easier for oxygen to enter. When that happens, the whole hemoglobin molecule will go into the relaxed state and take up four oxygens. This phenomenon is referred to as cooperativity, where binding of one oxygen molecule favors the binding of the others to hemoglobin. In fact, it is one of the examples of positive feedback in biological systems. Most control systems work by negative feedback. Here is an example, one of the few examples of positive feedback. Now, it is important for us to understand that hemoglobin can only exist in one of two states, either a tense form which has no oxygen or a relaxed form in which all four globin molecules have taken up oxygen. The percentage of oxyhemoglobin among all hemoglobin molecules is what is referred to as percent saturation of hemoglobin. We have to be careful about understanding the term saturation. There is some literature which states that this represents 100 percent saturation, but if there are only two oxygens bound to two of the globin molecules, that is 50 percent saturation, this is 25 percent, this is 75 percent with just three oxygens, etc. But the concept that has prevailed is that there are only two states 
one that is deoxyhemoglobin and one that is oxyhemoglobin. This is fully saturated. What do we mean by 50 percent saturation then? If you had so many hemoglobin molecules, if half of them were in the tense form and half were in the relaxed form, we refer to that as 50 percent saturation. This condition would be 100 percent saturation. That is another way of representing. In the relaxed state, all four oxygen binding sites are carrying oxygen. You have either this or this. It is kind of all or none. So, this would represent 50 percent saturation and this would represent 100 percent saturation. Though some literature claims that there can be intermediate forms with one, two or three oxygen molecules bound to hemoglobin that may not be correct and I would go by the concept that there can be only two states of hemoglobin, tense and relaxed. Now, what are the factors which favor the tense state and the factors which favor the relaxed state? Of course, the prevailing oxygen concentration in the immediate environment, the dissolved oxygen concentration is a major determinant of whether hemoglobin would be in the tense state or the relaxed state. A low PO2 in the surrounding would favor many of the hemoglobin molecules to go into the tense state, which means they would expel their oxygen and go into the deoxyhemoglobin state. And if partial pressure of oxygen in the immediate environment, dissolved oxygen is high, then more and more hemoglobin molecules will go into the relaxed state. Apart from dissolved oxygen, other factors which favor the tense state are listed here. A high carbon dioxide acidity, high concentration of 2,3-diphosphoglycerate and a high temperature. These are conditions which prevail in the tissue and therefore, the tense state is the preferred state under tissue conditions which means hemoglobin would give up, uh, many hemoglobin molecules would have given up the oxygen and gone into the tense state. Whereas, conditions which prevail in the lungs like low carbon dioxide after the carbon dioxide has been expelled, high pH, higher pH and low 2,3-diphosphoglycerate are conditions that favor the relaxed state of hemoglobin. Of all the factors that we have seen in the previous slide, partial pressure of oxygen or dissolved oxygen concentration in the immediate environment is the major determinant of whether hemoglobin exists in the oxy state or the deoxy state. The relationship between dissolved oxygen and the percentage of hemoglobin molecules which exist in the relaxed state or percent saturation of hemoglobin is the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. We already saw that we would think of this as 50 percent saturation and this is 100 percent saturation. This is dissolved oxygen concentration at which there is 50 percent saturation in this case and the dissolved oxygen concentration at which there is 100 percent saturation. Here is another example. So, the dissolved oxygen concentration here is 27 and hemoglobin is 50 percent saturated. For this dissolved oxygen concentration, the saturation is just 25 percent of the total hemoglobin molecules. This is a case of 75 percent saturation and this is 90 percent saturation. These are the dissolved oxygen concentrations. If we took the dissolved oxygen concentrations on the x axis and represented person saturation of hemoglobin on the y axis, we get the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. So, this is the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. This was constructed using severing osses equation. Let us see some well known x and y values. For a partial pressure of 90 millimeters mercury, hemoglobin is 97 percent saturated. That is 97 percent 
of the total number of hemoglobin molecules exist as oxyhemoglobin or in their relaxed state. At a partial pressure of 60, hemoglobin is still 90 percent saturated. At a partial pressure of 40, it is still 75 percent saturated. At a partial pressure of 20, most of the hemoglobin molecules have given up oxygen and saturation is only about 32 percent. In fact, what makes this oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve a subject for study is that the relationship is sigmoid and not linear. This tells us that in conditions till here, that is up to about 70 millimeters of mercury dissolved oxygen, hemoglobin likes to exist in the relaxed state and hold on to oxygen. Whereas, when the dissolved oxygen concentration is low, goes below 60 millimeters mercury, hemoglobin desaturates quickly. That is, more and more of hemoglobin molecules would give up oxygen and move into the tense state. That is what the steep part of the oxygen dissociation curve tells us. This is the arterial point at sea level, not at high altitude, where Alveolar oxygen can be about 100 millimeter mercury, arterial oxygen can be about 90 millimeters mercury and hemoglobin is almost fully saturated. This is the venous point in resting conditions in a normal individual, 40 millimeters mercury, where hemoglobin is still 75 percent saturated. Under exercise, venous blood would have lost more of its oxygen to the exercising muscles dissolved oxygen would go down to 20 millimeters mercury and hemoglobin saturation would have gone down to 32 percent. Now, this is alveolar PO2 as I said, an arterial PO2 can be there. If arterial PO2 is any less than 80 millimeter mercury, we would say there is arterial hypoxia. But you notice that even up to a partial pressure of 60 millimeter mercury, hemoglobin is adequately saturated, let us say 90 percent saturated and would serve its functions fairly well. But if arterial PO2 is less than 60, you notice that more and more hemoglobin molecules will like to exist in the tense state, which means they are not going to take up oxygen in the lungs. If for some reason arterial oxygen saturation drops below 60 millimeters mercury, then the ability of hemoglobin to take oxygen in the lungs is going to be less and we would start calling that condition where arterial PO2 is less than 60 millimeter mercury as respiratory failure. If arterial oxygen is less than 60 millimeter mercury, it can result in less oxygen being delivered to tissues or what we call tissue hypoxia. This is for you to appreciate the slope of the curve at different partial pressures. You can draw your own impressions about the functioning of hemoglobin molecule under different partial pressures of oxygen. We already saw that there are other factors apart from dissolved oxygen concentration which decide on whether hemoglobin exists in the tense or relax, relaxed state. These are carbon dioxide concentration, pH and the concentration of 2,3-diphosphoglycerate within RBCs. These conditions favor the tense state and these conditions favor the relaxed state. So, in tissues where these conditions exist, the dissociation curve would take the course along this black line, which is there is a right shift or at any given PO2, hemoglobin saturation is less than it would be if the dissociation curve was going along the blue. That is what we mean by a right shift, where the tense state is more preferred.
for every given PO2. Whereas these factors which exist in the lung favor a left shift which means for any given PO2 when there is a left shift hemoglobin saturation will be better than if there is a right shift. So left shift favors oxyhemoglobin and a right shift favors deoxygenation of hemoglobin. These are lung conditions and these are tissue conditions say. So with every quantum of blood moving from lungs into tissues, we could say that the pattern of oxygen dissociation curve goes from there to there. Okay. So this kind of shift hap happens with every cycle of circulation going between the lungs and the tissues. Of all these factors which affect hemoglobin saturation, the effect of carbon dioxide on hemoglobin saturation, low carbon dioxide causing a left shift or favoring oxygen uptake in the lungs and a high carbon dioxide as you would expect in tissues favoring a right shift or release of oxygen in the tissues. The relationship between carbon dioxide in blood and hemoglobin saturation is what is referred to as the Bohr effect put forward by Christian Bohr, father of the Nobel Prize winner in physics Niels Bohr and grandfather of another physics Nobel Prize, Prize winner. Let us learn another term P50. P50 refers to the partial pressure of oxygen at which there is 50 percent saturation that is at which 50 percent of the hemoglobin molecules exist as deoxy and the other 50 exist as oxy. How does that help us? It helps us to compare hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. So in a left shifted state you notice that P50 is going to be something like 20 millimeters mercury and in the right shifted case here it is 32 millimeters of mercury. It tells us the degree of shift. So it is a useful term when you are comparing hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. We will now see how to calculate the volume of oxygen carried in hemoglobin in a given volume of blood. If we are able to measure saturation in some manner, this is 100 percent saturated and this is 70 percent saturated. If we are able to measure saturation, then we can use this piece of knowledge that is when fully saturated 1 gram of hemoglobin carries 1.34 ml of oxygen that is a constant. So in a given volume of blood let us say 100 ml of blood 1 deciliter of blood we can estimate hemoglobin concentration in the laboratory and if we also know the saturation saturation into hemoglobin concentration which is the number of grams of hemoglobin in a given volume of blood into 1.34 will give us the volume of oxygen carried in hemoglobin in that volume of blood. Here there is only 70 percent saturation. So every gram of hemoglobin will carry 1.34 into 70 by 100 that is it will carry only 70 percent of that amount which would be this number. So that is a formula that you should learn. The amount of oxygen carried in a given volume of blood would be the hemoglobin concentration in that volume of blood into percent saturation of that hemoglobin into 1.34. Let us say hemoglobin is 90 percent saturated this and you have estimated hemoglobin concentration in blood to be 15 grams per deciliter then the amount of dissolved oxygen would be this. <coughs> Let us use 100 percent saturation for ease of calculation. This will give us 20 ml of oxygen dissolved for every 100 ml of blood. If blood had 15 grams of hemoglobin and if all that hemoglobin 
existed as oxyhemoglobin, which is what we mean by 100% saturation. Now the question is, how to estimate oxygen saturation of hemoglobin? Dissolved oxygen we saw was estimated as a partial pressure and for that you need to draw a blood sample. It is an invasive procedure. Now we are going to see that we can estimate saturation of hemoglobin with non-invasive methods. We can use a pulse oximeter to estimate oxygen saturation of hemoglobin. All of you are aware of this device given the pandemic era. We will now look at the principles of pulse oximetry which allows us to measure oxygen saturation of hemoglobin. Let this represent a finger. The technique of measuring oxygen saturation of hemoglobin non-invasively by just clipping a pulse oximeter onto your finger is referred to as pulse oximetry. The principle of pulse oximetry is an adaptation of what is referred to as pulse plethysmography. Plethysmography is a technique of measuring volumes, tissue volumes. Let us first learn about pulse plethysmography and then it will become easier for us to understand the principle of pulse oximetry. In pulse plethysmography, if this represents a finger, there is a light emitter at one side of the finger. Let it emit light of that amplitude. There is a receiver at the other end. This is called transmittance plethysmography. In some cases, the receiver is on the same side where light would travel up and down. That is called reflect, reflectance plethysmography. Let us talk about transmittance plethysmography. There is a receiver at the other end. The amplitude of light that is received by the receiver would be only that much because this portion is absorbed by the intervening tissue. This is the absorbed light and only a portion of the total light reaches the receiver. Now, when there is a pulse, an arterial pulse, which brings in a fresh volume of blood into the fingertip, the thickness or volume of the fingertip increases slightly as determined by how much of new blood volume has come in. When the thickness goes up, absorption increases. So, with every pulse, which increases tissue volume, absorption goes up and when the pulse recedes, that is when blood flows back into the veins and the finger volume comes down, absorption reduces. So, from this signal, we can extract out the changes in absorbance due to the pulse. So, this is an estimate of how much new volume comes into the finger this is what we call pulse plethysmography, where the amplitude of the pulse reflects how much of blood is coming into the finger with each pulse. If the amplitude goes up, you know there is more blood coming in and if the amplitude is smaller, you know there is less blood coming in. Now, in pulse oximetry, there are two light emitters, one which emits light in the range of red light and one which emits in the range of infrared. The next piece of information that we ne need to know is that the two species of hemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin have different absorption spectra. Oxyhemoglobin absorbs more of the infrared light and much less of the red light, whereas deoxyhemoglobin absorbs more of the red light and less of the infrared light. We are not interested in the other wavelengths as we are only using these two wavelengths of emitted light, red about 700 nanometers and infrared which is 900 nanometers. Infra because the energy of infrared light is lower than the red light. So, we do not have to look at the whole absorption spectrum. Oxyhemoglobin 
absorbs less of red light and more of infrared light. And with this information, using an equation, it is possible to calculate the percent of oxyhemoglobin in the total number of hemoglobin molecules. That is the principle of pulse oximetry. And given the way that this kind of differential absorption is studied in the new pulses that come in, we must understand that pulse oximetry estimates only oxygen saturation of arterial blood and not venous blood. This is called SpO2 or peripheral oxygen saturation. It is equivalent to SaO2 or arterial oxygen saturation. There is no non-invasive way of measuring venous oxygen saturation. We have to take a venous blood sample. To summarize thus far, oxygen travels in blood in two forms, that which is bound to hemoglobin and that which is dissolved in fluids, in plasma as well as the intercellular fluid. Let me also convey what I mean with this cartoon. This part is arterial blood and let us think of this as systemic capillaries. As blood moves through the systemic capillaries, it enters the veins and this portion represents the veins. We have also considered ways in which dissolved oxygen is measured as a partial pressure and the way in which oxygen saturation of hemoglobin is estimated with, with a pulse oximeter. We now have all the information required to estimate the oxygen content of a given volume of blood. We have to know the amount of oxygen bound to hemoglobin and the amount of oxygen dissolved. Dissolved oxygen content is calculated thus. We have to estimate partial pressure from what is called an arterial blood gas analysis which is done in the laboratory. If the partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood is 100, multiplying it by that constant will give us 0 0.3 ml of dissolved oxygen for, for every 100 ml of blood. And in that 100 ml, if we estimate hemoglobin concentration to be 15 grams and if oxygen saturation measured with pulse oximetry is 100 percent, we multiply it with this constant to get the amount of oxygen bound to hemoglobin in 100 ml blood. It comes to 20 ml. So between these two, you notice that the dissolved oxygen content is negligible when you consider the amount of oxygen bound to hemoglobin. We can do a similar calculation for venous blood. Dissolved oxygen content, I'm not going to worry because it is going to be even more negligible given that the partial pressure of oxygen in venous blood in the resting state and in the exercising state are far lower than what is there in arterial blood. For oxygen bound to hemoglobin, in the resting state, saturation is 75 percent and the calculations would therefore give us 15 ml oxygen per deciliter blood. In the exercising state, saturation is 25 percent and therefore we have venous oxygen content as 5 ml oxygen per 100 ml of venous blood. Now the issue is how do we get oxygen saturation in venous blood? Oxygen saturation in arterial blood is what is measured with pulse oximetry. So if we want to calculate oxygen content of venous blood, we need a measure of the saturation and how do we get it? This can be measured non-invasively with a pulse oximeter. But venous oxygen concentration is not measurable non-invasively. You have to draw a sample of venous blood, estimate the partial pressure of oxygen in venous blood and use that information on the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve to see how to see what the saturation is. For 40 millimeter mercury venous PO2, saturation is 75 percent. And that's how the calculations are done. When PVO2 is 40 millimeter mercury, saturation is 75 percent. That information is used in this equation to calculate oxygen content of venous blood. These two equations now tell us that 
the parameter which really matters to calculate the total oxygen content of blood is the amount of oxygen that is bound to hemoglobin. That is essentially the amount of oxygen carried in blood. Oxygen that exists in the dissolved form is negligible in terms of total oxygen content. Let us look at the quantum of oxygen existing as oxyhemoglobin and is dissolved oxygen in the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. We can add another y axis on the right side to reflect the oxygen content per 100 ml of blood for in this case hemoglobin of 15 grams per deciliter. Saturation is on the first y axis. You multiply that by the constant and by the hemoglobin concentration that you have estimated to get the right axis. So, this axis now reflects oxygen content in blood directly. At a partial pressure of 100 millimeter mercury, oxygen content that is bound to hemoglobin is near 20 ml. And this green line represents the volume of oxygen that exists in the dissolved state at 100 millimeter mercury partial pressure. It is a direct multiplication by 0 0.003. You have just 0 0.3 ml of oxygen in the dissolved state. Compare this with the quantum carried in hemoglobin and that is why we say that this is negligible. One question that may arise now is if the volume of oxygen carried in the dissolved form is negligible, is it essential to estimate it at all? especially because it involves an invasive procedure, arterial blood sampling. The answer is, while dissolved oxygen does not contribute much to the volume of oxygen carried in blood, it is an essential lung function test because this is the parameter which equilibrates with alveolar oxygen and in turn determines the amount of oxygen bound to hemoglobin. If there is impaired lung function, dissolved oxygen will reduce and so will oxygen bound to hemoglobin. You might then ask, why then do we need to estimate dissolved oxygen with an invasive procedure as this? Why can't we just do oxygen saturation because we can measure it non-invasively with a pulse oximeter? The answer lies in the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. Let us say lung function is impaired so that arterial oxygen is not 100 but 60. The amount of oxygen transferred from lung for example is not enough to increase dissolved oxygen to 100 millimeter mercury but only reaches up to 60 millimeter mercury. For a 40 millimeter mercury reduction in dissolved oxygen for that amount of impairment of lung function if you were to assess it with percent saturation, note that the saturation has only declined slightly from about 97 percent to 90 percent. Therefore, the quantum of reduction in partial pressure of oxygen becomes a much more sensitive lung function test than a reduction in oxygen saturation. Oxygen saturation still has its value because it can be measured non-invasively. We have realized the importance of oxygen saturation in the days of the pandemic because here was an easy way to assess oxygen saturation even at homes. However, in the hospital setting, especially in the intensive care unit, a more sensitive indicator of the degree of lung impairment would be partial pressure of oxygen. We come to the end of this lecture. In summary, we have discussed forms of oxygen transport in blood, methods of estimation of each of these forms, formulae for calculation of total amount of oxygen carried in that form in 100 ml of blood and the actual content of oxygen in arterial blood. That which is bound to hemoglobin is 20 ml per 100 ml of arterial blood and free oxygen dissolved in liquid is just 0.3 ml per 100 ml blood. Thank you for your attention.
The next session will be on tissue hypoxia.